<laughs> okay, not okay, sorry, enough of our rambling. Let's get started. Um, okay, so hi everyone. My name is Katie. I'm here with Shapa, and today we are back with our awesome host, Sharon Sapir, for another great webinar. Uh, today's topic is why your weight doesn't matter and understanding fat, which is so, like big topic, so I'm, I'm really happy to see how we dive into this. Um, and our host, uh, you guys, if you've been with us for our previous webinar series, um, Sharon Sapir, she is a nutritionist who does virtual counseling with clients all over the country, um, masters of science in nutrition and education, um, and she helps others achieve their health and weight loss goal while finding a balance. Um, so again, super excited to have her back. Uh, before I hand it over, if you guys have any questions throughout the webinar, go ahead and throw them in the chat or the, there's a chat and there's also a Q&A section. Either one works. Um, we probably won't address it till the end, but we will, we will definitely get to it and leave about 20 minutes or so um, specifically for any questions that you guys have. But feel free to throw them in there if you have it um, on your mind and we will get to it at the end. So again, you're here for the Shape webinar and I'm going to give it over to Sharon. Thank you so much, Katie. I'm just going to share my screen now. It's always a little bit of a transition. All right. So thank you so, so much for having me again for a, another webinar, this time about weight and fat. There's a lot of confusion out there. Uh, so I'll be looking at it from a bunch of different angles. You might be surprised at some of the research out there. And maybe you'll feel a little bit differently about your weight and fat by the end. We will see. So I'll be spending about 25 minutes or so. We'll go over BMI and muscle as it relates to your weight, obesity, and your health a very important and fascinating exception. I can't wait to get to that. How to assess your health, how to take it into your own hands, how to keep unhealthy weight off, your greatest accountability, ugh, accountability tool, and then we'll be doing a quick recap. So let's talk about weight. How do you know if you're overweight, underweight, normal weight, obese? I mean, how do we categorize weight? Well, we use something called the BMI, which stands for Body Mass Index. It's basically how health professionals size you up, so to speak, pun intended, um, haha, like guesstimate what's going on with your health. And you can see the equation, it takes your, it compares your weight to your height, right? Weight over height. That's about the extent of it. It doesn't factor in your frame, how dense your bones are, how much muscle you pack, which ironically, the healthier you are, you usually have denser bones and more muscle. So this is kind of an issue. And when you look at athletes, many of them would be technically categorized as overweight or even obese. And that's a problem, especially with female athletes that feel like, oh, wow, why is my BMI higher? Maybe I need to cut calories. That's not good for female athletes. So it definitely has its limits. And someone with greater fat and less muscle can have a lower BMI than someone with more muscle. Muscle, technically, you know, a pound of muscle weighs as much of a, as a pound of fat, a pound versus a pound. But muscle is a lot more dense. So muscle actually takes up about four fifths of the space that fat does. And if you see in this illustration, you can have two people with the same BMI, because they are the same height and they weigh the same, but one has more muscle. So they have, she has less body fat, 25%, versus less muscle and more body fat. And so the BMI really does have its limitations. It also doesn't tell you anything about your waist circumference, your distribution of fat, or your waist to hip ratio, which are really important indicators that we'll be talking about in a little bit. So we know that BMI weight isn't necessarily the best indicator, but we also know that having too much fat 
is correlated with an increase in developing cardiovascular disease. I actually had a professor who didn't say overweight, she used to say over fat, which I thought was very strange, but it makes sense because it's more to do with the fat that has this correlation. This increase is anywhere between 21 and 85%. Obviously genetics play a big role in that because that's quite a range, but the correlation is there. So now how does too much fat impact your heart? Well, I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly, not too technically, I hope, uh, but it's important that you know these risk factors. So the first thing is it increases your chance of developing sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is when you stop breathing multiple times during the night, and that puts a lot of stress on your heart. It also increases chronic inflammation. So what is inflammation? You might have heard this term thrown around quite a bit. Well, when you think of acute inflammation, that's your body's, your body's immune system's response to a foreign invader or like an irritant. So think of getting a splinter in your foot and how the skin around it gets very hot, red, and swollen. That's your body sending out those factors to create healing. But what happens with obesity when you have excess fat is the process of the fat cells getting larger and multiplying can cause the immune system to send out proteins into the blood that can eventually cause the plaque in your arteries to rupture, which causes a heart attack. That's a chronic inflammation. And having too much fat also increases your risk of heart abnormalities like enlargement of the heart or atrial fibrillation, which is a rapid and irregular heartbeat, which causes strokes and heart disease because it forms blood clots, not good. And lastly, it increases the risk of developing heart disease risk factors. For example, high LDL cholesterol. LDL is the bad cholesterol. It's the one that you don't want a lot of. It's a fatty substance made by your liver and too much of it in your blood eventually starts to line your blood vessels and it can create blockages that prevent blood flow to the heart or the brain. High blood pressure, that's the pressure of your blood going through your veins and the resistance it meets while your heart is beating. The narrower your blood vessels, the higher your blood pressure. And unfortunately, if that remains unchecked, that can cause a heart attack. Type two diabetes, that's when you have too much glucose hanging out in your blood, you don't have, the insulin isn't able to shuttle it into the cells where it can be used. And unfortunately that sugar damages blood vessels and nerves that control your heart. And lastly, I know this is just the funnest slide ever. Um, you guys are probably having a ball. High triglycerides. When you have, when you take in too many carbohydrates, you don't use the energy, your body changes that into a fatty substance that hangs out in your blood and your deposits. And unfortunately, too much of it can cause hardening of the arteries and arterial walls. So now that we've covered the downer of um, cardiovascular disease and how too much fat is correlated with cardiovascular disease, let's move on to the slide. I love this. Okay, so it's not a given. Yes, there's a correlation, but it's not a given. And one of the best examples is the example of the sumo wrestler. Sumo wrestlers are typically between 300 and 400 pounds. So they definitely fall into the obese category, yet they don't suffer from high cholesterol, high triglycerides, diabetes, heart disease, none of that. They wake up around 5 a.m. and they train until 10.30 p.m. That's a typical day for a sumo wrestler. They eat two gigantic meals, totaling about five to 7,000 calories. And those meals are composed of low sugar, non-processed foods. So a lot of stews with meat, vegetables, seafood, um, rice, yes, fried food, but not commercially processed food. And they sleep right after. So they train all day, they eat two huge meals and they sleep after. Why? Why are they able to be so heavy and not be at risk for these for, for heart disease? 
The answer is, and if you look over at the diagram on the lower right, fat, visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. They have a lot of subcutaneous fat. That's the squishy fat right under your skin. You know, like the fat you can pinch. Pinchable fat is good fat and they have a lot of it. They don't have a lot of visceral fat. Visceral fat is the fat that wraps around your organs. It's the one that's directly correlated with diabetes and heart disease. And so this is what keeps them healthy. Now, here is kind of the kicker. You can be outwardly thin with high visceral fat. And it's almost more dangerous because you don't have this cue, right? You don't necessarily know. Somebody who is categorized as normal weight or even underweight can have high levels of visceral fat that put them at the same risk for heart disease as someone who is outwardly overweight. So we don't want excess visceral fat. A little bit, obviously, we need it to protect our organs, but too much of it is dangerous. How do we get rid of excess visceral fat, too much visceral fat? They found that the answer is exercise. Yes, I know. Exercise. It's not just about starving yourself to be thin. It's about exercise. When you exercise, especially vigorously three or more days a week, you increase a hormone called adiponectin. And the job of that hormone is to shuttle the fat to your subcutaneous layer instead of your visceral layer. It's a very important job. So the more you exercise, the more of this hormone you have, and the bigger of a job it does to take fat away from your organs and towards your subcutaneous layer. Now, what happens to sumo wrestlers when they retire and they veer off their exercise routine and they start eating commercially processed foods high in simple sugars? Unfortunately, they gain visceral fat rapidly and they get the same diseases that have been associated you know, high blood sugar, triglycerides, cholesterol, and ultimately heart disease. So we know now that weight really doesn't tell you much, doesn't tell you very much about your visceral fat level, but we do have ways to assess our health physically. So one of the ways is to make sure you know your waist circumference. For men, you don't want to be over 40 inches. And for women, you don't want to be over 35 inches. Too, much, oh, too big of a weight circumference is indicative of higher visceral fat levels. And also pay attention to your waist to hip ratio. For men, you don't want it to be over 0.9. And for women, you don't want it to be over 0.85. You could, I'm sure you've heard of the apple shape and the pear shape. This is an example. Two women who likely weigh the same, have the same BMI, but they have very different fat distribution. The one on the left with the apple shape has more of the, her weight around her midsection versus the one who on the right who is pear shaped, has, she has more of the weight around her um, buttocks, tuchus, um, my favorite word, and hips. The one who is apple shaped is at a higher risk for cardiovascular disease, be likely because she has more visceral fat. Um, so you want to just pay attention physically. But you can also know your blood work. So when it comes to your blood work, obviously, your doctor can interpret your results. Um, it's not your job to know everything on there. But it is good to know a few key values and to be aware of them. And this might get me in some hot water, but some doctors are much more focused on treatment. So they won't notice if you're kind of starting, they're not so focused on the preventative side. They're there to treat, but you should know if you're on the higher end of normal. And with these specific blood markers, like your cholesterol, blood sugar, triglycerides, you might have to fast. So whenever you are told that you're going to have a blood test, always make sure that you find out if it needs to be fasted, because that will definitely affect values. And you also 
might have some different values because labs can vary. So I gave like a very kind of general guideline um, for your cholesterol, uh, your blood sugar, and your triglycerides. We covered what those are, but for example, let's say your triglycerides are 148. That still falls under the good category, but it's towards the borderline, right? Everything here is in your hands. You, through lifestyle and diet, exercise, you can change your cholesterol, your blood sugar, and triglycerides. So if you know that you're starting to edge up there, that's a great, that's a great thing for you because you have the control. You can change it, and you don't have to wait until you're necessarily at a high level to, you know, do something about it. The one value that you might not be totally familiar with is the C-reactive protein. Um, and that also varies by lab, but a general guideline is under three. And the C-reactive protein is an indicator of inflammation. So we talked about inflammation a couple slides back. Now, if you have an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis, it could be elevated because of that. But if you don't have any inflammatory conditions and it's high, that could be a sign that you have a chronic inflammation in your body. So if you've assessed yourself for health and maybe your waist circumference or your waist to hip ratio is higher than is optimal, maybe your blood markers are not as um, great as you'd like them to be, Losing weight can definitely lower your risk for cardiovascular disease. The, the problem is if you just focus on your weight and your weight alone, your chance of keeping it off is much lower. You want to put the right lifestyle habits in place so that weight loss is almost like a side effect. Because what they found is that people who diet down do have a change in their metabolism. Your hormones that keep you full and satiated, those go way down. And your hormones that make you hungry, those go up. It's your body's way of regaining the weight that you, you've lost. And it's really not fair. Um, I don't know how else to, to put it. So I'm gonna give you an example here. We have Brenda and Karen. They're both 150 pounds. Brenda has always been 150 pounds, and Karen was, let's say, 200 pounds, and she dieted down, and now she's 150 pounds. Brenda can eat more than Karen to maintain her weight. She can eat 2,100 calories to maintain her weight, while Karen has to eat 1,900 calories. They've found that people who have dieted down have to eat between 50 and 300 calories less per day than someone else who is the same weight as they are, but has always been that weight. If you think of The Biggest Loser, many of those contestants regained most, if not all, of their weight. And there's a few reasons for that. For one, they have to eat less than somebody else, so it's very hard to maintain that. But more importantly, they lost the weight in conditions that did not mirror their own life. They were completely removed. They didn't have a chance to change their lifestyle habits in their own life. And so getting back into that environment without having those habits in place and then working against the hunger and fullness, I mean, that is really hard. But you can lose weight and you can keep it off. Um, you, the more aware of the challenges you have and that you're up against, the better your chances of keeping the weight off. The National Weight Control Registry actually follows over 10,000 people who have lost a minimum of 30 pounds and kept it off for at least a year. And what they found is that this group of people has a few things in common that they all do or have. For one, they have a huge why. They didn't decide to lose weight to look better in a bathing suit. I mean, these were big reasons, like a health scare or having someone close to them die from heart disease um, or wanting to be around for their kids or their grandkids. I mean, they have really big whys. 
Next, they stay incredibly consistent. They don't, you know, treat the weekends as a reward for the week. Um, their weekends look a lot like their weekdays. They keep everything consistent as much as possible. But of course, if they veer off, because it's inevitable and we all do, they get back to on track very, very quickly. They're extremely resilient with that. Um, and they also exercise daily. Exercise is a common habit that they all engage in. And lastly, they use self-monitoring tools to track their weight, their food intake, and activity. So, as I just mentioned, they use self-monitoring tools. And research has shown that there is a correlation between people who have lost weight and kept it off and getting on the scale regularly it's because it helps with um, regulating your behaviors. If you gain two pounds, you might not feel it. I mean, like, especially if you like stretchy clothes, I love stretchy clothes, guilty. <laughs> you might not feel it, but if you're tracking your weight, then you might see, oh, I'm starting to gain. And then you can tighten your hold on your good habits, right? So that that gain doesn't become overwhelming. Let's take a look at somebody who might be tracking their weight during the week. They might get on the scale on Monday, notice their weight, fine. But maybe during Monday they had too much salt. It happens a lot, that causes a lot of water retention. And they get on the scale the next day and it's up two pounds. They're not happy. But throughout the day, they pee out the water retention, fine. They get on the scale on Wednesday, they're down a pound and a half, which they're happy about, but they're still up half a pound from Monday, so they're not so happy about that. Maybe then they have a tough workout, and the Thursday they get on the scale, they're up a pound. That's what tough workouts can do, but they're not happy about it. Then maybe they cut their carbs during the day and they pee out some of that water and they get on the scale and now they're back down a pound, which they're happy about, but they're also kind of not happy because they're still higher than Monday. Let's say they have a normal day, they stay the same on Saturday, and then by Sunday, they're down a pound, which they are happy about. Now, the ups and downs of the scale can be really frustrating. Many of us, some of us, won't get to Saturday and Sunday. We'll, be, we'll just say like by Thursday, Friday, ugh, what's the point? What's the point? Um, of course, these fluctuations are water fluctuations. We know that, but they still mess with us. But if we just keep our effort consistent, we do eventually see a drop. It does happen. It's just that for some of us, we'd never get there because of the frustration. And one of the reasons that the shape of scale is so revolutionary is because it doesn't tell you the number. It doesn't bug you with the number. I graphed uh, the same numbers down here and you can see how it would look like if you were using the shape of scale. Monday through Thursday, you'd probably see a green color. That's because you're within a normal fluctuation. The algorithm knows your normal fluctuation. So you're not gonna be bothered with seeing a little bit up, a little bit down. Everyone has a normal fluctuation. So you would see green and that's great. That means you're maintaining your weight. And then Friday and Saturday, you might see teal. And teal means that the um, scale has picked up that your weight is starting to trend down. So it's reflective in the color. And then blue, when the scale is sure that you've lost weight, right? On Sunday, you see blue, that's how you know that you've definitely lost weight. You don't have frustration, you don't have confusion. It's a way to still self-monitor, but without the ups and downs of seeing that number, right? It's, it doesn't have this like emotional trigger anymore. And not only that, the Shape of Health app prompts you with healthy habit missions that are individualized for you. Because the shape of health philosophy is not about just your weight and losing weight and focusing on that. It's about living a healthier life where weight loss is really a side effect. 
because the right weight for you is the one that you reach while living your healthiest life that you actually enjoy. That's really the goal. So just to do a quick recap, weight by itself doesn't tell us much. I hope you guys understand that by now. Weight alone just doesn't. Um, but excessive fat can increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. The type of fat as well as the distribution matters, right? Your apple shape versus your pear shape, that is important. It does tell you a lot. Losing weight and keeping it off is very difficult. That's why we want to focus as much of our energy on maintenance <laughs> than even losing weight. But you can lose weight. You have to focus on habits and really treat weight loss as a side effect of those better habits. And you want to take advantage of self-monitoring tools, whether that's like a food log or a scale, like the shape of scale. So we'll be doing a Q&A now. If I don't get to your um, questions, you can always email me at, well, I got my bar, uh, Sharon at shapa.me, or you can find me on Instagram. I'm always happy to connect. Awesome. Thank you, Sharon. Um, we already have a ton of questions in here, so let's go ahead and get started. But now's the time. If you guys have any extra questions, go ahead and throw it in. Um, we're going to spend some time going through these. Um, okay, so we're going to start with a q and A. I'll go back and forth between chat. We'll make sure to try to get everyone's questions in here. Um, and we're going to start with Amy. She said, do you recommend a different measure or jumping off point to replace the BMI? Um, wondering how to address with the client when they get this from their doctor and want to know more, how to interpret, et cetera. Okay, so stop the chair. So instead of BMI, like what to use? Is that the question? I think, I think that's kind of like, if you're working with a client and they're so focused on that. Yeah, well, I would first look at, um, body frame, if your body frame is larger, then your weight is going to be higher. It's just because your bones weigh more. Um, so someone is of a bigger frame and there's ways to, if you Google it, there's a ways to measure it. It's like you measure your wrist or like your elbow. Um, that's one thing. If they're athletic or if they pack on a lot of muscle, that's something to consider. So again, I really place a lot of emphasis on the waist measurements, even more than BMI, because think about it, you can have someone who's very thin and their BMI is low, but if their waist to hip ratio is too large, I mean, they could be holding a lot of visceral fat and you just don't see it. So BMI could be a starting point in some cases, like BMI does apply to you if you have a small to medium frame and you're sedentary. I mean, it's, it's pretty <coughs> accurate there. Um, but if you're not, if you're not small to medium framed and sedentary, then it doesn't. And I would really go by the other measurements and, and look at your blood work too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was talking to you about this yesterday with BMI and I played college soccer and I remember looking at the um, BMI list and like my weight and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm obese. I was like, what? I was like, there's no way I'm obese. No, it's it's really not a good indicator for athletes. And I'd say it's even maybe dangerous because female athletes especially struggle with low energy availability, which can wreak havoc on their hormones. And so thinking that they're obese when they just are either bigger framed or have more muscle is unfortunate. Totally. Um... Oh, just quickly, Heidi said, is it possible to watch this again later? Yes, we are recording this, so um, you guys can totally go back and watch this. Um, it'll be on our YouTube channel, Shape of Health, um, and then we're also going to post the link to our Shape of Health Facebook page. Um, okay, continuing on, Amy had a follow-up question. So, Brenda versus Karen, how do you define always being a certain weight? Does that mean she's never dieted? Um, is that her natural weight? Can you clarify that, please? Sure, that's a good question. So she is just, that's her like natural set point. Yeah, she has not been at a higher weight and dieted down. That's just where she's been 
naturally. Yeah, once you lose weight, like five to 10% even, that's when these metabolic changes occur. And it's just a reality. It doesn't mean don't lose the weight. It just means know that you'll probably be a bit hungrier, at least I think, I don't think they have a specific time, but from the research I read, like after two years, it normalizes a bit, um, but that's a long time. So if your habits are in place, it's then uh, you don't struggle as much than if you're just focusing on your weight, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, great, so moving on to Tammy. She said, what is the name of the hormone release um, when you exercise to, de to decrease visceral fat? Um, oh, sure. Sorry, it's, I never know how much science to put in this because I'm like, I don't want people's eyes to like glaze over, but I find it interesting. It's called adiponectin. It's A-D-I-P-O-N-E-C-T-I-N, I believe. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm one of those people where I'm like, okay, a lot of these sciencey names, what am I going to pick up? <laughs> Trying my <Yeah>. best. But <laughs> I do appreciate those who are like, yes, I know that hormone. One day I'll get there. <laughs> um, um, Amy, another follow-up from that, she just said, and you might have already answered this, but you said, can you repeat why someone has to all, um, someone who's, who was always 150 can eat more calories to maintain what is happening um, physiologically? Yeah, so I probably don't have all of the science down with this, but basically your body becomes less efficient at burning energy. So you, from the, from the examples I read, it's like if someone, who's always been 150 can run three miles and burn 300 calories, you would have to run four miles. It's like your muscles become extra efficient at holding on to calories. Your body becomes extra efficient at using those calories. You become too efficient at using calories is what it is. But it, it is pretty sciencey. If you want, there's a really good book. Um, it's one of my favorite books. It's called The Secret Life of Fat. And I don't remember the author's name right now, Tara something, but, but it's called The Secret Life of Fat. It's, it goes well into the science and it gives you case studies too. And it's fascinating. Oh, cool. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to hop on over to the chat. Um, we're going to start with Shalom. How does childhood weight slash overweight impact adult tendencies to gain weight? And at what age does it matter most? Interesting. I don't know too much of the research on this, so I'm not going to give a answer aside from what I would think is that a lot of habits from childhood carry over. Um, and children can develop insulin resistance, which of course that increases fat storage too. But I don't really, I know that being overweight or obese in childhood does increase your risk of being an overweight or obese adult. That I know. And also fat cells, once you gain them, they don't go away and they have their own hormone signaling. So I think that is part of why it makes it harder to be a normal um, normal weight or like not be overweight as an adult, but it's not a given. Mm. Yeah, I liked that part in the webinar when you kind of gave the downer reality of like, okay, if you lose, it is, but you're like, the first part is just being aware. If you lose, you know, this much weight, you're kind of dealing with, you're always going to have to be consistent with it. And then giving us the whole, okay, here's, here's how to stick with it. It is possible, you know, it's, but it's, you know, stick with it. Um, okay, so I actually have this question also. I wrote this down too. This is from Dan. He said, um, why can a workout give an immediate weight increase? Doesn't muscle gain take, um, doesn't muscle gain take a longer time? Oh yeah, so inflammation, basically inflammation. Mm -hmm. And not the bad inflammation, not the chronic inflammation, it's an acute. So when you work out, you break down some muscle, it has to repair itself in the repairing process. It takes more water, just like when you have a splinter and you get, you know, the skin around it gets swollen, that's fluid retention. Fluid helps with healing. So it's just, it's just that. And also there is some sort of chemical process where you 
you absorb, your muscles absorb more carbs. And when you have more carbs absorbed, water is, goes with it. So then you have that too. So it's just, it's a temporary thing. And yeah, it's good. It's a good thing. Keep doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Like, you know, it's a good thing, but you know that feeling when you're like, you had like a really good workout, you like sweat it out. And I don't know, you go step on the scale and you're like, what the heck? I'm like, you're so discouraged. That's why I love the shape so of scale. Good? That's yeah. the shape of scale. You're not going to see that bump up because there's a normal fluctuation that everyone has with water from either working out or having too much salt. The scale knows where that that fluctuation is for you so you're not bothered with it you just see green and you're like oh cool I'm maintaining because maintenance is awesome we celebrate green right totally yeah and it goes back to your like consistency and long-term effort where it's like gotta just keep moving forward and, and stick with those habits because like working out it's not easy to get that into a routine if you're starting from scratch absolutely and it gets discouraged like the worst is when you've been doing so good all week and then you just get so bummed out like oh yeah, you have to have a long-term view. You really do. You just can't look at it short-term. We, we don't lose fat very quickly in the short-term. It has to be a long-term view with a focus on habits. I know it's like super unsexy, but it's the <laughs> truth. <laughs> it's the tr habits are the new trend, <laughs> new weight loss. <laughs> long-term. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tim asked a really good question. He wanted to know uh, if Shapa measures anything in addition to um, your weight, and it does. Um, so um, when you step on your Shapa scale with bare feet um, through bioelectrical independence, I'm saying that right, it can calculate your body composition, but it can also um, estimate muscle mass, fat percent, visceral fat, and bone mass. So it really calculates the whole story of what's going on in order. And that's kind of why sometimes if you're seeing the same color for a few days and you, you feel like you've been losing weight, it might take, you know, one more day because the shaper really wants to make sure that if it's showing you blue, it's showing you teal, that it's, it's you're truly seeing, like you're truly seeing progress. Um, so it definitely takes all of that into consideration before revealing, which is also fun, like your color. Like, oh, it makes it feel like way more real when you do yeah. see it. And it's very sensitive to like an uptick, which I was surprised about. Like if you just start to trend up, like it'll tell you with the light gray color, which I love that because it's so much easier to turn that around when it's just started than when it actually becomes like real weight on you. Um, so it gives you like that nudge and it won't change until it knows that you're back down. Yeah, totally. I mean, in seeing the light gray, like, okay, I'm truly you know, gaining weight versus even when you see the, the scale go up, that might not be true. And then you're starting to do things that are drastic to bring it back down when really that could have just been a normal fluctuation if you're looking at the number point, um, as you had said. Anyways, continuing on, um, uh, Ron Vest said, don't people have, um, don't people have some form of natural shape? How does that influence our tendency to lose weight more easily? Yeah, so some people are naturally more apple shaped than they are pear shaped. And there is a genetic component to that, right? And a genetic component to your, to your chances of developing cardiovascular disease. So if a family that might have a lot of heart disease might have more people in it who are naturally more apple shaped. And yes, changing yourself from an apple shape to a pear shape is probably not possible but you can still change your waist measurement and your probably less so your waist to hip ratio, but definitely you can get your waist measurement down into a healthier um, measurement. Yeah. Number. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, and then going back over to the Q and a <clears throat> Tim had said, can you repeat the waist measurements you should aim to be under? I am 6'1 female. Yeah, so waist is 35 and under for women for their waist. Okay. 35 inches, I should say. Yeah, and we will also, um, this is recorded, so, and, and so her slides will also be on here, um, and you can go back and definitely look back at her list and um, important information that might not have written down. 
Um, okay, Barb, she said, I was not, I was unable to log in until now. Will this be recorded? Yep, totally. Um, thanks for joining us. Even though you hopped on a little late, you can catch up with the rest of it. We'll be uploading it within the next hour. So we'll, um, we'll let you guys know when it's up. We'll post it on Shape of Health Facebook as well as Shape of Health YouTube channel. Um, okay, let's see here. Oh, um, Heidi had asked, um, she said, thank you. And then she said, do you recommend intermittent fasting? Good question. Um, so in general for women, I don't. It's been found to have a different effect on men and women. Men tend to do really, really, really good with intermittent fasting. The research has shown that overall women do not do as well. They don't have quite the same benefits as the men. That said, there's plenty of women who use intermittent fasting and they feel great from it. You know, just because there's like that bell curve, you know, there's always people here and people here. And I wouldn't knock anything until you try it because you might be one of the people who really benefits from intermittent fasting. Um, it's just individuals. So overall, no, but try it. That's my answer. That's my answer to like almost everything diet. <laughs> Because you never know. Never know if it works. Everything, things work different for everyone. Yeah, exactly. Um, great. Okay, so we have a Q&A here from Lori. Hi, new here. If Shapa monitors other body composition measurements, then are we able to see those? Um, great question. So if you guys want to see your number, you totally can. Um, so you go through the calibration period, shape it, starts understanding your natural fluctuations, the algorithm gets used to um, your tracking, and then once a certain period goes by, we have enough information, you go and your progress review is unlocked. Um, you can choose to see it or not. I know some you know, the big part of Shapa is not seeing the number, but if you choose to see it, Shapa will show you the starting weight and the weight difference that you have since you've started Shapa, as well as the body fat percent of change. So um, those are the two uh, main measurements that you can see in your progress review. Um, yeah, so, but if you have any more questions, go ahead and ask, or you can email our, our team at askshapa at shapa.me. Um, and we can dive into the more technical terms of it. Um, in addition to the right. Okay, so another good question. Um, sorry if I get your name wrong. Yen, I'm so, I'm so terrible with names, but um, do you have to do the monthly subscription in addition to the price of the scale? Um, great question. So yes, you do have to get the subscription with the scale. The big part of it is the program. Um, like we said, like tracking, the big part is making sure that you're staying um, on top of your progress, but also the missions and the everyday tasks that are like continuing to push you towards your long-term goals. But right now, actually, if you get the yearly or the three year, you can get your skill for free. So that's a $99 value. Um, you use the code SHAPE2020, you'll get your skill for free. Um, and you'll, so then you just end up paying for the subscription. Um, that's the yearly or the three year. Um, but they do go hand in hand. It's kind of like the awareness, the stepping on the scale and then continuing with the tasks to work on those habit, changing, habit changes for your long-term goals. Um, but great question. Um, sorry, I kind of rambled there. But okay, so we are, oh, sorry, I got one from Kevin. Um, so if you're doing everything right, calorie deficit and all, staying teal and blue, what um but still fluctuating just trust in the process and figure it's just inflammation from your workouts then um sorry i'm gonna reread that question so if you're doing everything right so you're seeing the teal and the blue you're you're still fluctuating trust the process and figure it's just yeah exactly yeah, yeah. that's exactly it because you're we never just stay the same. And even like what I find a lot, at least with my clients, is that they will kind of fluctuate, 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 
but then they'll have like a whoosh. So like they'll be almost like holding on to water until their body is decided to like, okay, I'm gonna let go of the water now. And then your body does it on its own time. So as long as you know that you're doing everything right, consistency, consistent, like keep going, keep going. It's the most important thing. It's the hardest thing, but it's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I can't, I mean, I've said it a million times, but it's kind of like in, you're in for it, not for short-term results, but long-term. It's a long-term game here. Um, okay, we are, I think we're up to date on questions on Q&A and chat. We'll give it another couple minutes. Um, oh, I'm just kidding. We have one from Tommy. Okay. Um, about how many days do you see a color or oh, a change in color? I'm staying real for seven days now so far. I'm teal. I'm thinking you meant teal. Um, yeah. Okay. So basically Shapa will look at your past few days compared to like the past two weeks or 10 days. Um, so you could see a color change from anywhere from a few times a week to um, even like once or, or not at all. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's not going to change every single day. It's going to continue to track your weight, your day, couple days weigh in and compare it to the back to the previous weigh ins um, and will change off of your natural fluctuations. And it won't change until it's sure that the progress that you're making is real. Um, so that's kind of based on the algorithm of how that works. Another great question. <laughs> okay. All right. I think for real, we are up to date. But again, if you guys have any more questions, throw them in. We'll probably go one more minute. So throw them in now. Or if you guys think of it later and we are off, go ahead and email. If they're for Sharon, you can email her at um, Sharon at Shifa.me. Is that right? <laughs> that sounds right. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. Yeah. And if it's yeah. a specific um, Shapa question, you can reach us at askshapa at shapa.me. There should also be um, an email li link to this webinar. Um, so you can go ahead and email that one too, and we will respond as soon as we can. Um, Again, we will have this recorded. Shapa Health is our Facebook page. Um, my Shapa at Shapa.com is our website if you guys want to learn more about us and as well as our YouTube channel. Um, Shapa Health. Um, AJ said, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. um, okay, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you guys so much for joining for another webinar. We are hoping to do um, more of these soon. And if you guys have any webinar suggestions or things you really would like to hear, we would love to hear because it it's really about what you guys want to hear from us, especially from Sharon, who is just a wealth of information. Um, so go ahead and email us like, hey, I want to hear this topic. Maybe we'll take a vote. Um, but we hope to be here with a few more coming up this summer. Uh, all right, guys. So thanks again. Uh, we will see you next time. Thanks, guys. Bye, Katie. Thank you. Bye.